Um, I just wanted to start by, um, uh, I made a few notes from this morning's plenary sessions because I thought they were highly relevant to what I'm going to talk today, about today, but uh, two of them were from, from Dale Vitt. And one, the first one was about turning to natural systems to learn about how natural systems work to inform um, reclamation or approaches to reclamation. And also the long time frame. Now, this, the forest ecosystems uh, or stand development doesn't take as long as peatlands, but you're still looking at, you know, 75, 100 years. So you do have to be patient to see uh, things change. And um, the other comments were from Richard, and I was happy to see that he showed his work on the forest floor removal, and by not having a forest floor, how that dramatically decreased site index, and uh, also to illustrate uh, the high stem densities that naturally occur for aspen or post-disturbance, um, 20,000 stems uh, per hectare. He thought 2,000 stems per hectare was not that great. But, and I'm just guessing, but I would say probably even less than that is planted on reclamation sites. So you're starting out with very low stem densities relative to what would naturally occur. So um, the, I'm going to talk about using the forest floor as an indicator of forest ecosystem recovery, and that's for reclamation, and uh, with the intent of developing a forest floor criteria and indicator manual. Okay. So, and I, I just wanted to emphasize that forest floors are different from agricultural soils, that they do build up these organic horizons on the mineral surface that uh, agricultural soils don't, and uh, we can refer to that as organic horizons, LFHO, the humus form, the forest floor. I'm just using the generic forest floor. And these, the, the state, status of the humus form indicates uh, something to us about nutrient cycling, the biotic community, and carbon storage. But in agricultural soils, they lack this very uh, convenient physical representation of these underlying processes. So it's what we, we can actually see this, and we should be, uh, you know, taking advantage of that, using that to our advantage. So I'm just focusing on this area, uh, the forest floor. So uh, in outline, I'm going to talk about the challenge, the objectives of our project, the missing link in reclamation, the forest floor, the role of coarse woody debris our methodologies for creating the manual and expected outcomes. So the challenge is the objective of reclamation in Alberta is to return land to an equivalent land capability that existed before an activity was conducted. And there seems to be a search for indicators that are easy to assess in the field uh, to track reclamation success. Uh, some of these criteria or indicators are, are not well defined. And there certainly is no requirement to establish a natural forest floor but I think most forest ecologists would argue that this is a key ecosystem component. So our objectives with this forest floor project is uh, to calculate the inputs to the forest floor from trees over stand development that are required to build natural forest floors. And to do this, we'll be using the carbon budget model of the Canadian forest sector, and we'll verify our results using data from field samples. And we also want to develop a forest floor criteria and indicator manual to provide recommendations for what those inputs should be and then how to use forest floor characteristics as indicators uh, to monitor the success of reclamation. So why is the forest floor important? Well, I think we all, all should know um, that all the, the organic horizons that build up on top of the mineral soil originate from all these organic materials and that they play an essential, the forest floor plays an essential role in carbon storage, biodiversity, site quality for tree growth, and it's essential to forest in ecosystems and is an indicator of a healthy functional forest in the boreal. The other um, feature of the forest floors is that they have quite a bit of variability. They can vary in thickness from zero to 40 centimeters, and they can have fairly diverse composition. And that can vary with stand age and with different site types. Um, I just quickly Googled last night for some things on the effects of forest floor removal. Um, I learned when I was young about this from studies done based on this Europe the European litter raking studies. Uh, it's very common silvicultural practice in the 18th and 19th century. So lots of studies have been done to show that by removing the forest floor, 
Um, you can decrease soil base saturation and there's some recent study to show that this loss um, was equivalent to that what um, is currently experienced in Europe from acid deposition. It's left a legacy of soil carbon loss and uh, there's many studies. I looked at there's one, this one from New Zealand, uh, reduced productivity in trees and uh, the last one, the Canada one, is actually referring to the work that Richard spoke of this morning. So I just wanted to compare these two images of the forest floor from um, a reclaimed site. So the one on your left is from the, from the gateway site. And you can see that the forest floor after 30 years is extremely thin. It's only like about a centimeter thick. And it's mostly comprised of dead foliage, mostly from coniferous needles. A natural forest floor post disturbance on your right, or your left, sorry. Um, so that's 24 years after a natural disturbance. It's quite thick and compositionally it's, it's a lot more complex. So often a, a large proportion of the material uh, making up the forest floor comes from coarse woody debris originating from tree stems and branches. And coarse woody debris inputs will be necessary to build forest floors. I've just shown a graphic of some of the samples. Uh, actually, each bar is a different site. And then on your far right, just an average value. But just to show you, uh, for each one of those sites, maybe 20, 25 uh, forest floor samples were collected. And uh, it's just the frequency at which uh, the samples have more than 50% uh, decayed wood in them. So there's a lot of, lot of decayed wood, and on average, about 40%. I just wanted to um, review some uh, standard deadwood dynamics that are natural after a wildfire because these inputs um, are absent or may be absent on reclamation sites. So what uh, we're trying to show, uh, illustrate here, this is a time of a fire, so the stand before the fire and then stand development after the fire. At the time of the fire, um, the red line here, we're just basically showing how carbon stocks change over time. So this is a time of the fire, and before the fire we had live trees, and then the fire hits, they basically all get killed, and then the live trees grow back. And prior to the fire, there's, there are standing deadwood or snags. These uh, snags would all get transferred to coarse woody debris, but now there's a huge pulse of snags, all the new snags, and they will be adding coarse woody debris over a period of about 20 years to the forest floor. <clears throat> and the third uh, source, of course, woody debris comes from stand closure. So, and this is where the stand density or the stand density factor comes in. These stands are normally quite dense when they uh, are reestablished. And then over time, a lot of these trees uh, die as they naturally thin through competition. And a lot of that wood gets added to the forest floor as well. And there even could be a third point where our stands start to break up and decay when they're very old and you'll get more additions of woody debris. So most of these are missing in reclamation. So in our uh, forest floor project, uh, we're going to use the carbon budget model to estimate these carbon inputs so we can use the model to back calculate all those transfers of woody debris um, when they occur over time and what from from what components of the tree. Uh, we're going to validate the, the model results two ways. We've uh, collected a lot of forest floor samples and we're separating them into the components that the model would predict and then comparing them to see if the model is compositionally and mass wise predicting about what we would get in the natural forest floor. And then we're also, uh, we've also collected a lot of samples from different sites types over different stand age classes. And we will compare uh, the modeled results to what we measure in terms of that progression of forest floor and how it develops over stand age. So I just wanted to draw your attention um, in this, these series of images from your left to the right. It's uh, how a forest floor would develop in a jack pine site. So a young stand, it's, I, I want to draw your attention to it qualitatively, not quantitatively. 
but is mostly comprised of uh, needles in the younger age stand. Then it be starts to become more complex and it's full of decayed wood and then finally decayed wood, a lot of fungal mycelia and, and mosses. So we also want to produce a visual guide with descriptors for how that forest floor develops over stand age. Um, we're going to base that on the BC humus form classification system, I think, because I think it's the best one out there that we have right now. Um, you know, and we're often taught about, you know, mull, motor, more, but mostly what we deal with here are the more uh, humus form types. So the BC system has a very nice way of describing those. Uh, basically, the three stages of decay, that for them that's hemi, hemi, humi, and humi mores. But they also provide language to describe the composition of that humus form. So I've just provided a few examples here from your left to the right. You know, ligno is one that's dominantly wood, myco dominantly mycorrhizae. The residio is kind of like a mixed bag of stuff, sphagno, obviously mosses. And then, um, and these are just a few examples, but they have this neovello, which is really the thin, just pure uh, litter, dead litter. So our expected outcomes are that we are going to produce this uh, manual which will combine forest floor taxonomic knowledge and forest carbon modeling uh, to provide recommendations for tree biomass inputs to develop forest floors for different ecocyte types and will also provide visuals and metrics of forest floor development over stand age for different ecocyte types as an indicator to track success in rebuilding natural forest ecosystems.